We're nearing the very end of the AATS Macho Conclave 2015, and as I said a little bit earlier, we're maybe saving the best for last. Is that correct? So we've got uh, an interesting panel group gathered here to talk about innovations in mitral valve repair to improve patient outcomes. Please be joined by Dr. Vinnie Bepat from St. Thomas Hospital in London and Rudiger Lang from the Munich Heart Center in Munich, Germany. So Vinnie, the, the, a lot of talk about valve and valve, valve and ring. Tell us what the, the current status is for that. Hey Gandhi, thank you very much for this opportunity to share thoughts. And uh, as you know, that tower has become a common procedure, uh, not just Europe, but in the US as well. And one of the innovative uses of tower has been to treat a degenerated heart valve. And especially in US, the trend has been to implant a biological valve for last decade, right, I think. Right. So we are going to see these young patients coming back. And till now, the only option was to do a reoperation. So tower gives us a good opportunity to implant a tower valve inside this, so to speak, a degenerated valve. Less invasive procedure, very attractive to a surgeon as well as the patient, but there are limitations. And uh, the emphasis has been to teach the community about the limitations of it. And it's very important to know what valve we are treating. All valves are not same, same like cars. And if you know the valve, then you can treat it properly. And we need to understand the limitations of the tower devices as well, uh, because there can be some interesting complications such as delayed embolization, or even there is a bit debate about anticoagulation. Right. Same way for rings as well, as we know that mitral repair is the therapy of choice. But there are repairs which fail, especially in not such expert hands. And I think when the patients come with a failed repair, we have a good opportunity to use the tower device in the same manner to treat these patients. Again, there can be some interesting problems, so there's a lot of effort we are putting in to so, address so this. So through the wonders of animation, we've actually beamed Dr. Adams in to join, <laughs> <laughs> join, our, to join our panel. David's been a little bit busy here at the Conclave. So Vinay, you, you were telling us about the setting. So what are the, so tell us a little bit more, and let's start with valve and valve. What are the characteristics uh, that, that you're looking at, or if would say this might be a candidate? So I think the first important thing we have to make sure that this, this procedure is done under fluoroscopy. So it's very important that we get to know the valve better. And then if you know to know the valve better, you can treat it better. And that definitely it's less invasive. And we have seen in Europe as well as the US now that you can either do this procedure through transhepical or transhepical approach. So there are some careful consideration about the anatomy of the heart to see which procedure is more suitable or not. At present, only sapient device is used. I'm sure in future there will be other devices, such as Lotus device, which is manufactured by Boston, or maybe even purpose-made devices. So I think it's a very attractive approach, but uh, we have to make sure that the patient doesn't have what I call as a LVOT obstruction or delayed embolization. So we are working on the algorithm at present, and the research hopefully we'll be able to share at the end of this year. Uh, to see whether the, you can predict whether the patient has this tell, problem. Tell me, tell me, and you all jump in. Tell yeah. me some more specifics. So, so you're, so what are you? So I've got a patient. What are you looking at? So yep. you're going to look at it on fluoroscopy and see. Okay. So first thing I do is when the patient comes in and it's within the tower criteria, so to speak, I would then look at which valve it is, which size it is, so I can see whether it fits the current tower devices. And then the next thing I look at is, is there a chance of LVOT obstruction if I do this procedure? And the way we look at it is very simple. And the concept is very simple in, in terms of that is, what we measure is the angle between the aortic annulus and the mitral annulus. And if it is less than 110 degrees, there's a great chance that this patient will have LVOT area reduction of 70%. So in that case, we reconsider the patient for a reoperation. So, so it's, 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 it's akin then to, to looking at SAM, predicting SAM postoperatively. Yeah, is that right? Pretty similar to that. So that's one thing you look at, David. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I, I don't. I, the, you must not have a lot of experience creating SAM with these devices. So, are, what, what's your? You, have you had a case that told you that, or because there can't be any any. There's not a lot of data about systolic, about, about uh, LV output track obstruction after 
transcatheter mitral replacement, regardless of what, whether, whether it was done for calcification through a ring or through a valve. I realize it's a risk. I'm just curious how you settled on that number. So I think the, the, the whole thing came because we had a case. So we did a live case for London Valve two years ago. You're almost like a surgeon. <laughs> you had it one time and now you've made a rule. I like that. So, but this patient uh, after three months presented in a much dire state than before. And to be very honest, complications are less reported, especially by surgeons. I think we report always good outcome, but this LBOT obstruction is underreported. So when we communicate with the tower teams now, the incidence of LBOT obstruction is it's not that uncommon. So the series published by Vahendian's group, which is a 12 mitral valve in ring cases, there were three cases with increased LBOT gradient. We don't know what is the definition of increased LVOT gradient, but I think we should be aware of it. What we are saying is that when we are considering these patients, especially the cardiology community... So, so this is now, we're still valve and ring right now? Valve and ring. Okay. Well, valve and valve is pretty similar, kind of, because okay. when you put the stent, it gets covered it's by the, the same thing. Okay. okay. But is this, is, this for, what, is this a risk for the valve or for the patient? Like when you say valve and ring, right. then my antenna goes up. Are those old patients or un patients that can't have reoperations or who are these people? So I think if, if you take a surgical program, generally these patients are the patients who are very high risk for open surgery. Okay. But if you see the programs which are driven by interventional cardiologists, this could be any patient which comes through the door. But what we're trying to just say is that Please consider these possibilities because with tower, if it goes well, it's, it's great. But when it doesn't go well, it actually creates another dilemma. So you can jump in whenever you want to. So so you're talking, we're looking at patient selection. So that's one criteria. What else? You, you want to know what kind of, if this is valve and valve, and obviously ring, you want to know what, what's some more selection criteria? Apart from that, currently the choice of device we have is only Sapien or Sapien 3 now in Europe. Uh, so there are three sizes available, 23, 26, 29. Uh, so what we see is we need a two millimeter oversize for the average diameter. Valve is less of a challenge, the rings are a bit more challenging because certain rings are very rigid. So if you put a sapien in those rings, it's going to deform the valve. It's not going to become circular. So in our bench testing, we found that out of 17 rings, which are commonly implanted in the last 10 years, there are seven rings which are more conducive to the valin ring. The rest are not that, I would say, valin ring friendly. It's not that you can't do it, but then you will be left with some PV leak or you'll be left with some intravalvular leak. So one needs to be aware of these limitations and not treat all the rings as one ring or same, the same kind of ring. So if I get a patient with a classic carpenter Edward ring or an IMR ring or a geoform ring, I am very careful in putting these patients for valin ring. I probably, I wouldn't do it. That's for sure. Interesting. You got some comments? Yeah, I think like uh, David said, I mean, the indication for valin ring is very limited. So in one center, you will not see too many patients. Uh, this may be the reason why we have never seen LBO2 obstruction uh, by valin ring. And we are much more liberal with valin ring. I think this is a perfect procedure and uh, we're considering it almost routinely now, in, in, at least in patients uh, beyond 60 years old. And, and oftentimes they're, they're, they're 80 years old. Right, so it, right. I think the valve and valve in the elderly population that have elected to have tissue valves in their 60s and now they're coming back in their late 70s and 80s, I think that it's got a lot of potential. And Rudiger, I saw a case in your unit done by Sabina. I was so impressed by the pre-op imaging and how well it was able to plan the procedure. It really was pre-planned. It was CT and then Faro drug. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. I was there too. So, yeah, and I'm, a, great, I'm, a great example of that case was the patient was sitting in a chair waving at us in the afternoon. So yeah, I, I was probably, I, I won't forget her. And you, and, you, and you made the statement, I don't forget that you're going to send all of your redos to, 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 to do medical tourism. <laughs> now I've got two people. I think on the way. Exactly. I've got two people. Well, I can send them really to you now. So, so let's go back to the valve and valve, okay? No. Just, go, just for my, my edification, the audience's edification. So, are there a selection, other selection criteria you do? No, there's nothing. I think, as David has said, I completely agree for mitral space. 
usually the bioprosthetic valves are bigger in size, so less chance of patient process mismatch. Interestingly, in the global registry and the case of the case series is reported, you will find that the mean gradient and peak gradient, despite having a big sapien valve, is slightly higher. There have been cases, uh, because I teach TAVI all over the sure, world, sure. I come across them more than they're reported, of even minor or delayed thrombosis as well. So I think anticoagulation is one thing we all should focus on. These valves, once you perform a valve in valve, is neither a tissue nor a mechanical valve, it's somewhere in between. And I think I like to give anticoagulation for three months if patient can tolerate it. I think it just takes away that risk of uh, a, a thrombosis or, and I've seen examples where thrombosis building within six days or seven days. So I, I think, think we tend to give that. That's an excellent point. Yeah. And you know, you're really within the guidelines. Most centers are treating, you know, surgical biological valve replacement with anticoagulation, but you're right. We really don't know enough to be too comfortable about those connections, whether or not to anticoagulate patients. I think that's a good point. Development ring procedures. Uh, would, would you say that there are rings that are explicitly uh, good for a valve and ring procedure, and others where you would caution, or even you might say never do it? Absolutely. I think uh, so. There are seven rings which I think that if you're doing a valve and ring procedure, the three criteria I look at is one is can they be seen very easily okay. under fluoroscopy, which is because its procedure doesn't include. Right. Second is, can they become nearly circular? And that's quite important. And the third thing is, can it provide a good anchor? Because it has to anchor the valve, it's sutureless valve. Now, just to give you an extreme example, most incomplete bands are like that, so they don't provide a good anchor. So if you put a sapien valve, maybe, not maybe, but it will move after some time. So for certain rings, which, uh, like geoform ring, for example, and IMR ring, which is used quite a lot, they tend to distort the valve. So if you are if you are compelled to do it, you should do it, but you should watch the sapien. As soon as you think it's starting to deform, you should stop because it will anchor between the anterior posterior sure, diameter. Sure, sure. You may get some PV leak, and we have done a case where we put an occluder device later to mm -hmm. stop it, mm -hmm. rather than trying to get you know the perfect shape. So so but he, he's asking a different question. Is there are there rings currently out there that you think you know, are more amenable to doing, to your, your criteria that yeah. you have. So, uh, Sorin's Memo 3D ring, then the Physio 1, Physio 2 ring, and then you have got Duran or Anchor Band, which is there, uh, these and the Simulus ring by uh, Metronic. These rings are semi-flexible or semi-rigid, and they can be seen very well as well, and you can make them circular. A word of caution is any ring which is above a size 34, when it becomes circular, it's generally more for even the 29 valve. So if it's 34 or 36 ring, 29 valve is not going to stay there if you inflate it. It's an so. interesting discussion. I'm not sure I'm going to pick my ring based on my interest in <laughs> transcatheter re-replacement down the road. So this is actually a challenge for the uh, manufacturer. And uh, I feel that can we not design a ring which is, I would say, TAVI proof or future proof? For example, the IMR ring, you make it of a material which you, when you implant does the job which you have in mind, but in future, you can also make it circular. And I, I think that's the challenge to the community in general. I see. So it's an interesting concept there. Is, is, uh, do you hear what he said? Uh, David, what do you think? I think it's going to be a very small percentage of patients that are going to that are going to have a, a, a ring implanted that then fail and need a transcatheter valve. So I, I mean, again, if it was a feature that was part of the new ring, that'd be great. But but it's not going to be a, a, a it's not going to be an idea that's going to drive the new ring. But David, do you think with um, in hands of expert surgeons, the failure rates are low? But as the community is pushing more and more for repair, every surgeon is pushed to do repair, and the failure rates are actually, in, in practice, going to be much higher. So my feeling as not such an expert mitral surgeon is if I start doing mitral repairs in the volumes you do, I will definitely have much more failure rates than what you and Professor Lange have. And I think we are, what we're trying to address is probably the entire community. Yeah. Uh, that no, is I, mean, what are your thoughts? I, I agree completely with what you say today, 2015. 
may, but maybe 2025 will have a totally different threshold of implanting artificial wells. Maybe to implant a mitral valve in, in 10 or 20 years is, is a normal procedure and repair is looked at uh, some very old-fashioned procedures that you don't do anymore. Well, I, I'm not ready to go there, but I am ready to give you this, and that is, is that you're right. As the transcatheter field moves forward, for primary repair failure, that would be very attractive for patients. I'm thinking about that video of a mutual patient that I took care of for you that you showed this morning who was a physician, a surgeon, and he was telling us that he did perfectly. And he was saying, my gosh, I don't know if I could ever go through that again. It's a big deal having heart surgery. I don't care whether you use scopes or robots or what you do. It's a big deal having heart surgery for a 50-year-old. And you're right. If we had the data and you could do it the way I saw that transcatheter valve put in your institution, that could be so, a very interesting bailout so one day. So you're really, you're thinking in the future as, as, we, as we progress along. And I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think this wave of transcatheters is coming in the selected patient. So you're thinking for the future, we ought to be listening to what Vinny is saying and with the design Absolutely. of the rings. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting concept. I mean, it, uh, really interesting. So, so let's, can we switch topics? I'm, we're not going to get away from valve and valve and valve and rings, but <laughs> so Rudiger, Rudiger, tell us a little bit about what's happening in the world of the anterior leaflet. The anterior leaflet prolapse is, is kind of a, a a disease that uh, still cause for a lot of surgeons uh, panic and, and anxiety. And uh, I, I think in, in recent years, we do more and more anterior leaflet repair with excellent results. Uh, David's group has shown this and other groups too, that the results are almost not different anymore from, uh, from posterior leaflet repair. And uh, I think even bileaflet and anterior leaflet repair should be repaired. So, so what's, I mean, you know, I, I, obviously Tyrone's data in this, uh, you know, talks about anterior leaflet. Is that, so since we don't see it now, is it because of the excellence of the surgeon, the difference in techniques? What's changed that if anterior leaflet was such a, a pitfall, anterior repair in the past for recurrent? I will probably get into a discussion with David, but, but I think the, the advent and the, the frequent use of new has changed the, the approach to the anterior leaflet. It has just made it easier because res for resections on the anterior leaflet, and, and David has shown this during this meeting, you need a lot of experience and, and a little, to be a very good mitral valve surgeon. Now, to put a neocord on the anterior leaflet, you don't need a, as much experience. Huh? It's fairly easy to do. How do, you, how do you do that? Tell me how you do it. I mean, you've got <laughs> excellent people here. So you say it's very easy. No, it's it's easy because uh, you, you can put as as many uh, uh, cords as as you have to, and you see exactly where the anterior leaflet is still prolapsing. And uh, now we even have a, a, a device from from Sorin where where you can even determine the length very precisely, the length of the artificial cords to the anterior leaflet, which makes makes it even easier in the future. Program. It's funny. I was just just in a de degenerative session, and um, I was asked by someone in the audience, what, what are the, if I'm not a high volume surgeon, what are two techniques, what are the techniques I should focus on? Like I wanna get good at something as opposed to trying to learn all the stuff I've seen in the last two days. And, and I, I don't know if Rudiger agrees, I told him there are two things I want you to learn how to do next year. One is a triangular resection. You know, get some practice on each case, a triangle if you're gonna do a resection. Don't go straight to a quadrangular resection and learn how to vary the height and the width of them and get some practice doing that and learn how to use your suture to close a triangle to create tension. The second thing is learn how to put in neocord. You, you, I don't care which technique you use, but you've got to use neocord as your, as your one of your two techniques that you're really getting comfortable with in degenerative valve repair. And it's funny, this knot tying has been an issue, all these papers talking right. about complexity of it. And I've always thought it should, the, the knot basically starts in the plane of the annulus. And for posterior leaflet, it's usually a little bit low, depending on the height. Anterior leaflet, it's slightly above. But it's funny, I've, I've seen this reaccord, this little yellow string on, this, on the Soren ring presented several times the last two days. And every time it's presented, someone sitting beside me makes a comment, oh, that's a really neat idea. 
And I do think that plane of the annulus is so important. And particularly the lower volume you are, I think that this is a is worth looking at because it's another one of those tools that might help you understand the plane of the annulus. It's a visual. And you, Rudy, I've seen some of your videos. They're, they're pretty convincing, I must say. So, I mean, so you're, you've done, you've, you're doing this commonly now, using this? Oh, we just started uh, a couple of months ago, but uh, our initial experience was very good. So um, there's no reason not to do it. We have uh, some of the older surgeons uh, said in the beginning, oh, we don't need this. I mean, we can do it without. But now they also use it. So uh, it, it, very fast, it, it came a, a, a daily tool. It, well, I'm it's like anything, Randy, you're going to, you know, I think that, that you're going to see some people get some more experience with it. I, I do think that you're going to see that become another one of these. I think it's going to be an interesting tool, particularly for lower volume surgeons. I, I see, I think that it will learn more, but I, my first impression is it's a pretty neat idea. Right, right. Well, I've learned a lot here. I mean, and, uh, Vinny, thanks very much. You're, you, you and Rudiger are talking about 15 years from now, 10 years from now. I'll be in a, I'll be in a walker and <laughs> in a dentalist when that happens. But you, I'll say you were right. you into the microconclave, <laughs> buddy. Right. He was right. We'll bring you into the microconclave in a wheelchair. 2027. Yeah, 2027. I don't think so. Thank you. If I'm here, you need to shoot me or euthanize me. But seriously, thank you very much, Vinny. And uh, Rudiger, and obviously, David, excellent, excellent discussion. Thank you.